that's one thing I really like about your work um, is that, um, well, like I made a decision many years ago never to teach any principle that I hadn't found useful and valuable in practice myself. And you do the same thing. You actually do the work. And I think that's one of the things that gives your work a lot of power. Well, I love it, and I know that in my when I first started on the spiritual path and being with teachers and seeing how insane a lot of them were, it was just <laughs> it, it was depressing. I went through a hard time once with a teacher who I really admired, and then I got into their inner life and was horrified. And so I think because that experience, I believe that we don't have any experience that we're not meant to have and learn from, I really learned and I said I always want to be somebody who, that I can practice what I preach. And am I perfect? I'm not. And anybody who knows my work knows that I share a lot of my own process. In fact, I started blogging on the Best Year site, which is really great because I get to share, you know, my inner struggles. And I, I'm a human. And, and actually, I, I wouldn't give them up because every time I have one, I learn from it and I feel like I evolve and grow and have the opportunity to test out my work. Beautifully said. Well, what do you think is, like if people were going to take away a central idea of one practical step they could do to create the best year of their life, um, what's something that they could do? Well, my favorite chapter, I think, uh, is the chapter on fantasy. And what the chapter on fantasy does is it busts the fantasy that one day that you're waiting for when I finally get on Oprah, when I finally finish my movie, when I finally when my husband finally starts treating me this way, when my child goes to college when I finally have enough money that that one day fantasy I feel is what robs people of having the best year and creating, being responsible right here and now, there's nobody in the world that can make your life great but you and so we're always giving up to that, that, that dream when this finally happens. And so the fantasy really busts that. And, but more importantly, it, it has you look and see how are you going to feel when you finally reach that place. And I believe that that feeling is what we're searching for. And the fantasy is just the soul's way of kind of showing you, telling you you need something else. So for an example... Um, I, I share in the book about when the book, when uh, Dark Side made number one. My fantasy was that one day I would become number one. Well, after I became number one, I was depressed. Actually, I never even enjoyed it because I was so busy that, and I didn't even know what it meant to be number one on the New York Times list, to tell you the truth. I remember screaming, and then that was it. I forgot about the whole thing. I didn't, I didn't understand it at the time. But afterwards, I went into a very dark time, and I remember being, uh, I was leading a seminar, a shadow process at the Chopra Center in Deepak, and somebody else came over and to congratulate me, and they're like, well, how you doing? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm not doing that great, and you know, I feel really sad. And what I realized is that I was searching for this fantasy and thought that when I got there, I would suddenly feel like I mattered. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was your fantasy, that that was the one that was going to do it for you. Exactly. And then there was no fantasy, and I still, because I didn't know how to make myself matter to me, or I didn't really know how to acknowledge myself, and I realized after that, Gay, that I could just call Aunt Pearl. She would tell me that I mattered. Or my sister Ariel, she would tell me that I, I mattered, and that I needed to take that back and take responsibility and, and tell myself why I mattered. I was going too fast to, to matter in my own life. And so when I started doing that, so I distinguished the feeling and what I needed and started waking up every day and saying, what could I do to feel like I mattered or feel important or feel worthy today? And I just did it for six months. And at the end, I felt tremendous. And all of a sudden, there was nothing out there to chase. Mm-hmm. And so I tell people, if you're looking for respect, if you're looking for admiration, if you're looking for love, if you're looking to feel successful, how will you feel when you're successful? 
You know, you'll feel important or you'll feel worthy to start now. Give up. You're not going to find it out there. And I know you know this from working with a lot of people who are celebrities or that have a lot of money. Almost all of them go through this, like, oh, my God, I finally got where I wanted to go, and, and I don't feel like I'm supposed to feel. Yes, exactly. And um, I just wanted to um, put in a plug again for um, people on the call to be sure to go to bestyearofyourlife.com because it has some really wonderful things on it. And uh, particularly I wanted to mention the um, blog that Debbie's writing. Um, and uh, I learned something about you that uh, really made me chuckle because it's exactly what I do. You were mentioning in your blog that you have 50 sticky notes all over your car, your purse, your computer, your desk, and uh, you write uh, notes on the back of receipts and business cards. Well, one of the things that happens when I come back from a trip is I literally download all of the little sticky things and pieces of paper and everything that I've gotten from my trip. Uh, and if you looked at my desk right now, you'd see little uh, yellow sticky He's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's when I went after becoming radically organized, and I realized that was one big sticky note. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hired an organizational person to come in uh, a while back to help me out, and she took one look at my desk, and she said, she kind of groaned, and she said, oh, no, you're one of the yellow sticky note people. You know? <laughs> um, so um, why do you think it is that so many of us kind of sabotage ourselves when we're trying to achieve our goals and dreams that we somehow get in our own way and and even do that more than once. We become serial saboteurs, I guess you might say. <laughs> uh, so why do you think that is? Hmm. Well, the first thing that comes up to me is a, a quote that my friends Paul and Lane Cutright once said, the guilty seek punishment. And I feel, especially since I do so much uh, 